Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will begin uh, with uh, sort of my little verse here, which I made it in haiku, but it didn't quite work. I was a little too hard, but my personal uh, definition of architecture. Architecture is the shaping of space with objects in light to create practical and emotive places. Uh, welcome today to Home in COVID Time. And uh, it's important uh, to pause and realize that uh, we are meeting today at a time when 100,000 of our sisters and brothers have died uh, from COVID and we are still very much in the middle of this. And um, we're gonna to talk today about our uh, starter home prototype and more. The first half of today's presentation will be the and more part and the second part will be uh, starter home. My name is Michael Lair. I'm the founding partner of Lair Architects Los Angeles and uh, my uh, partner, the managing partner of our, of our practice, Darren Kadrabegovich, will also be presenting with me. I'll just quickly mention uh, some of the uh, uh, team members who, uh, most of whom are still with us, but some have moved on in the past few years, uh, who have been working on these projects, Roberto Scheinberg, Alex Clark, Nicole Chu, uh, Benjamin Lair, Ashley Favre, Aidan Kaderbegovich, and Hamish Dixon. And wherever they are, they're part of the work we're gonna be seeing today. So home is where histories begin and where values are born. And of course, place matters. Making home is a primal act of the architect. In, in COVID time, the entire world has consciously and subconsciously a new awareness of home and its centrality to human existence. Uh, the world has been hunkered down in homes, some which are good and some are bad. People fortunate enough have been working, living, being like we are all doing right now at home slash remote and have necessarily deprivatized their homes and revealed new aspects of who they are. Home has never been so universally shared and focused on. Uh, the intimate and the public is melding in a new way in our homes. Uh, now, before COVID, the homelessness and affordable housing crisis was really beyond our imagination. And, and because of that in Los Angeles, a really rare opportunity to create what we would call more complete communities. It is the unavoidable unavoidability of our sisters and brothers living on the street that in this moment commands everybody's attention. So for the last few years, there's been a level of focus, introspection, invention, implementation and an, and an unprecedented opportunity to, to transform our Angelino sense of the wholeness of our community. And in terms of the notion of complete, a complete city and complete communities, uh, everyone in every community deserves to be respected and actually to be housed in every community. So we'll be looking at the notion of completing community uh, uh, and the home's relation, uh, role in that. Uh, this notion of the continuum of housing from the untended to people on the street to the fully homed. We'll be talking about the way we are delivering these projects that we're working on, uh, the notion of teaming and partnering. I don't believe there is any other way to achieve uh, complete value or maximum value than uh, partnering, whether it's de facto or a legal partnering, but everybody needs to be on the same page. That's really the only way to achieve excellent outcomes and maximum value. Uh, throughout, we'll try to highlight really the centerpiece, our alpha and omega, which is design. Uh, we'll talk about how we came to the prototypes, the micro units, um, sort of the fundamental ideas of uh, loving community and, uh, and the role of of respect and honor for every community in which we all design and build, procession, space, light, ground plane, color, and so forth. So as we all know, it sort of begins with this idea of the primal hut. So deep in, uh, deep, uh, deep, the, deep seated in our wiring as humans, we are part of the human, uh, we are part of the animal kingdom. And it is so much more than need. It is a fundamental place of privilege. 
from the untended to homeless on the street to the well-homed to the eternally homed sort of understand the ideas of shelter, identity, state of mind, safety, power, prestige, accommodation, memory and prophecy, aspiration and sanctum. These are important to every human being and they are the qualities that constitute home. Another one I, uh, I add is, a, is personally important and that's the notion of harm reduction. In my 18 years on the board and as past president of Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles, really the guiding rubric to all that we do and we provide healthcare, uh, sort of integrated treatment, uh, training, supportive care, uh, and uh, a, a lot of real uh, thought leadership in the field. Harm reduction is the idea that where, wherever you are is good. We meet you where you're at with zero judgment. It's incredibly important for people at the bottom of the social ladder, but as it turns out, it's important for all of us. Uh, harm reduction, whether it's your family, your spouse, your colleagues, your friends, a neighbor, a homeless person, good for everybody. Be nice to everybody and try not to judge and then you'll get the best results. So in terms of the continuum of housing, um, there is the, 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 the idea that uh, from all of these uh, clientele, from the homeless to the homed, uh, one learns from every client type, whether they're homeless or very well home, each of these projects informs the other in terms of what constitutes home. On the lower 60% uh, of the page, you see sort of this continuum from public at the bottom and the black line separating the homeless from the home. There's a notion that the degrees of privacy that you have are in direct relation to a sense of home and well-being. You know, if you live in a home that has a little pathway uh, to the front door uh, a, or a porch and then a foyer and then maybe you come into the living room, those transitions add a level of grace and, and, and joy that makes a home a better home. If you are living on the street or on a lot and the only transition is coming through the door of your tent or uh, coming into your sleeping bag or less, uh, that, uh, that is uh, the opposite of that and does not constitute home or grace. So we begin this notion of the continuum of housing with the untended to homeless. So here, if we look at the epicenter of uh, our homeless population in Skid Row, San Julian Street on the top, two of the projects, we are right now in between two of, of, of our projects on San Julian Street for this population. And then down below, uh, we see uh, uh, folks in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Echo, uh, in Echo Park by the lake. So that was the untended to, really, Probably the biggest challenge is the tens of thousands of people living on the street, we still haven't figured out how to attend to them and provide them the dignity of being able to bathe or, 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 or go to the bathroom in a, in a safe and healthy and private way. But then there's the tended to homeless. This is a project that I designed uh, 20 years ago with Christian Arndt and Farouk Amin. Uh, and it's the Downtown Homeless Drop-In Center, uh, a pet project of Mayor Reardon's. It was an invention at the time, really unprecedented. It was a place for people living on the street to come as a respite. It was a courtyard for the first three years without gates, so no judgment, no questions, just a welcome greeter at the gate. And um, uh, we had about 3 million visits in those 13 years before it was changed to a shelter, which is an it's a good thing, but it's not necessarily an important thing. This was an important project. Today, sort of drop in center light is the refresh spot, which actually homeless healthcare operates, which has bathrooms and showers and a really important place for people on the street. But this was a very, a really happy vibe in this place. There was a clubhouse, a courtyard, a laundry, showers. So if you lived on the street, you could launder your clothes, you could shower. You could sleep outside in the courtyard or on the rarest of occasions and if there was an available bed for eight hours. Important project. What these projects and projects when you work for people at the very bottom of the social ladder teach you is that beauty 
is absolutely a rudiment of human dignity and for no population more so than those, you realize it that when you design something for people with very little else, it really makes a difference. This is the Jim Wood Community Center, 18 years later, still operating fully. And I remember when it was in construction and that the sort of purple, lavender, blue went on the back wall behind the white columns and I was standing on the street and uh, 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 a person who I, I think lived on the streets came up to me just to say, you gotta be here when the clouds are behind the columns because it really looks beautiful. That was a, a touchstone moment for me. And I believe that to be true uh, in terms of beauty for all of us, but particularly these folks. So then we go from the tended to on the street to transitional shelter. Now, uh, one of the things which was not obvious to me, and it's an important thing to understand and is not at all intuitive, is that shelters are not, sh people in shelters are homeless. Shelter is not home, is not housing. So uh, this is a project that uh, will be done. Uh, this is a project, one of the cities, uh, about a dozen um, bridge, uh, sh bridge housing shelters. Uh, this one we designed uh, this is in the Valley on Etna Street uh, for 70 folks, um, three weeks to design and three months to build with COVID. The, it, it's delayed the construction by three weeks. So this will be opened at the end of, of, of June. What it shows is that where there is a will, there is a way. Um, uh, the design team was present every moment to design and our consultants our engineer CNG, uh, Barbara Hall, and then the city also was incredibly available. The only custom structure we did was that yellow one. There you see the 70 beds. Uh, the, the building is pre-designed, the uh, commissary building, uh, with this, uh, uh, and then the, um, the shower and um, uh, 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 laundry units. Uh, the site, you know, but w we worked the site and we really used uh, sort of our preferred material uh, when there's no money for anything else to make place, which is color on the ground plane and color on the buildings uh, to really add a sense of place and specialness. And uh, as always, we try to achieve a significant sense of delight. So that gives us to uh, uh, introducing the, the, the notion of our, our project delivery system. We are part of a team we, which we formed called uh, Rethink Housing. Uh, the team existed in fact three or four years before we formalized it. And uh, I'll just brag on the fact that our team was the top ranked team in receiving uh, HCID grants uh, to support our housing projects. So our team is made of a developer, Genesis LA, uh, which is a community bank a, a, a lender and investor led by uh, the brilliant uh, uh, Tom de Simone. Uh, then the lead, well, then our, our our leader is uh, the relentless and amazing John Perfit, who has run RNLA Restore Neighbors Los Angeles for many years, and we've been working with both of them. John knowingly, uh, uh, Tom not so long for about six seven years now. Then our team, we're also working on several of the projects with Brenda Curry and Curtum Construction. SSG, which is our supportive service provider, uh, uh, Brian Wee, and, uh, and then others. So um, these are the tenets of our Rethink Housing uh, team. One-stop shop, vertically integrated. So you have development, uh, you have financing, and you have design, and then even uh, supportive care and construction all in one team. So when we identify a property, as a team, we'll do an initial vetting of uh, the design possibilities and uh, the financing possibilities to see whether we should go and buy that property. And that integration remains significant until the end. We just did the impossible in one of our projects and brought it in on a ridiculously low budget last week by doing just that. Uh, small sites and small projects, we are going for sites which would not work for conventional lenders and conventional developers, uh, you know, as narrow as 40 feet. And um, that's been really uh, uh, the focus. Uh, some projects are bigger and you'll see uh, the range of the projects we've done today. To date. 
uh, we, uh, we aim to work on projects where you can do everything by right, uh, which is easier said than done. I'm not sure that there is even such a thing that truly exists that way, but we try to be as close to that as possible. And also uh, no parking. So our projects, our projects are, um, uh, most of them are predicated on TOCs, transit-oriented community regulations, which allow you to have no parking. None of our projects would work uh, with parking. I'll point as a as a, a new a new initiate of the uh, uh, a new passionate electric uh, electric uh, uh, bike uh, e-biker. I appreciate the importance of uh, of the massive amount of bike spacing we have to produce. Uh, 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 pr providing all of these projects, even though um, it's a lot less than parking. Uh, our, our, our culture is grounded in learning and teaching, uh, realizing that we, like everybody, will make mistakes along the way and we'll do it wrong before we do it right. Uh, grounded in mutual admiration and respect, uh, we trust that if we don't get it right, we'll be able to figure it out together. So we cut each other slack and learn lessons along the way. Uh, design excellence is a premier value. It supports civic purpose and honors human dignity. As, I, as we said, we believe that beauty actually is a rudiment of human dignity. And finally, uh, all of these things can, together conspire to create lower development co costs and shorter development times. So uh, first, uh, a project we uh, recently completed a few months ago uh, as Rethink LA is transitional housing for what used to be called Youth at Promise and is now called, uh, you, uh, no, used to be called Youth at Risk and now Youth at Promise. This is in East Rancho Dominguez Hills, Compton, uh, a blighted property for 20 years. And uh, let's say uh, two units, uh, five bedrooms in each unit. And uh, these are uh, for, uh, again, uh, uh, high school students uh, at, at risk and promise. Uh, you can see uh, uh, along the right edge, there are uh, uh, two sets, of, there are five bedrooms, two sets of two bedrooms, each two sharing a bathroom, and then a large living space, the same on both floors, large windows, lots of, uh, uh, there are skylights, large windows into the neighborhood, open and friendly and trusting that that openness will be welcome uh, by the community and wholesome for the, the, the people living there. And so far that proves to be the case. The, the community has been thrilled with the project. Uh, here you see a uh, bathroom alcove uh, with two bedrooms on either side in yellow there, skylight in both cases, that's on the second floor. Also one of the, um, a design rudiment of ours is very, uh, is, is a really a, a well orchestrated procession and uh, making that as explicit as possible. So here you'll see the wall, the entry to the lower units and the stairs to the upper units are called, we use uh, the um, concrete paint here. So when we can't afford limestone, we use paint. Uh, when we can afford integrated concrete, we do that, but it's a way of leveraging, squeezing value out of all these elements, which you have to build anyways. And just the idea of fitting in and standing out is another tenet of ours. And here you see on the street, it actually has some freshness, which is really well received by the community, but even uh, across the neighbor's house sort of fits in somewhat innocuously and pleasantly, and that's really the idea. So now we go, oh, oh okay. So now we go to uh, these micro units, which is where we are at right now. They're, they're small, they're 270 to 300 plus square feet. Uh, in addition to uh, Rethink LA, we have been working with one of the leading uh, 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 provider, nonprofit uh, builders of affordable housing in Los Angeles for many, many years, ACOF, a community of friends. Uh, we, were, we have been tasked in the last year to design prototypical units, particularly one bedroom, two bedroom, and, um, and uh, um, studio units and then prototypical buildings for so that they could be ready uh, when sites become available. Uh, what was this uh, work? So uh, here you can see, so what we built is we built, uh, you know, a half inch models of each of the units. 
And more interestingly, well, so we met with their leadership group from all their projects. It, this was really, I would say, one of the great experiences of, of my career. Um, these are people who have been homeless, who have been in jail, who may have uh, various uh, mental health issues. Uh, and we had uh, some very profound meetings. In this case, in our studio, we built a full-scale mock-up, albeit only four feet high, of a unit and it was both illuminating. I mean, people could really talk about things that mattered and things that they would have poo-pooed in words. They actually, like floor to ceiling windows, uh, fa you know, facing the outside, they really got excited about. It. Really important and exhilarating. So now we go on to our projects, our tranche of projects, rethink projects. So this is our basic, um, our basic micro unit. On the left, you see in the up-down direction our circulation. At the bottom is a door and a side light, operable side light. On the top is a floor to ceiling window, the same width of the circulation zone. Uh, bathroom on the left, as you know, uh, or you may know that, of course, the minimum size uh, ADA bathroom is, even if the unit is tiny, the bathroom can't get smaller than that. So then there's the living area. We, we use the ground plane design to to achieve other kind of readings for the space. And then on the right side, um, we, we, we gather the uh, pantry, uh, the, the fridge, the sink, the uh, hot plate, and then a built-in counter uh, to stretch from the entry uh, all the way uh, through the unit. All of the units you'll see, uh, the projects uh, have this. And uh, now we go to another transitional uh, uh, project uh, another youth at promise. This project was the first one we were awarded by HCID. Uh, I won't say how long ago uh, or how long it's taken, but it hasn't been a short amount of time. Uh, it is permit ready. It's in Boyle Heights, eight units for uh, youth at promise uh, and um, very important to fit into the neighborhood. We originally had an angled flat roof and at a community meeting, people very kindly asked would we look at uh, a, uh, a gable roof? And we did. And that ficus tree in the front, uh, which you can see, uh, you know, you, you can see the trees in front of that red volume. We uh, work really hard to save it. It's really important. So here you see the, uh, the gable at the front morphing into the flat roof. The roofs are not glass, but it's open to the model. And you can see the units and you can also see how the unit design is very tied to the open space outside. It's one, it's one conception and in housing, uh, these outdoor, indoor, outdoor relationships are incredibly important, particularly if we, again, we think about procession and how that works and honors uh, the experience of living here. Here you see the basic unit. Uh, in this case, they're a little larger. So the entry is, is, is uh, you actually enter at 90 degrees to the unit, you get a longer processional space and you also get an alcove shared by two units. Uh, a similar project is uh, the city of Willowbrook, LA County. And um, uh, this is seven units uh, and a community room. That's the volume, that triangular volume on the right. It's next to a church who uh, is our, um, um, nominal partner with, not financial partner with, but we've partnered with them so they can use the community room and together the projects can enhance the community. There you see it in Willowbrook Ave, that dramatic diagonal street, and there you see it in red where the property is. So here you see the community room and then you see how our pathway is orchestrated to zig and zag, sort of create multiple views as you turn and walk across the property. Again, uh, this is just ground plane design. It, uh, there is planting when we can afford it, um, gravel, concrete, uh, but really important in terms of reinforcing sort of the architecture and the music. We like to refer to the music of housing. So then we go to the uh, larger, uh, uh, our larger projects. Uh, this is Westlake, which is Westlake and, um, Westlake and Temple. Uh, here you see a big model and then behind it a smaller site model and then at the upper uh, on the left You'll see I'll zoom in a little closer. There it is in a rendering of the site um, uh, 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 Temple Boulevard is the main boulevard going left to right 
And there's a little one-story old retail building on Temple, which works nicely to, uh, in fact, create a multi-use uh, complex. It's a very narrow property, about 40 feet wide. And again, single loaded corridor, cross ventilation, exterior uh, ventilation, light from both sides, and uh, big, big views, uh, big glass, floor to ceiling glass from the, uh, 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 from the backside of the building. Uh, density here is about 100 unit, 190 units per acre. Uh, next project is on 62nd Street in Normandy. Uh, same mission here, same units. Uh, this is in a CPIO, Community Plan Implementation Overlay District, uh, which requires 14 foot first floors. Uh, I deeply respect the intention of it to have a appropriately lifted uh, commercial level floor. Uh, it needs a little bit more resolution because you do pay a serious price for it in spaces that don't need to be so high. The roof is uh, required open space. It those are planters and accommodates uh, photovoltaics, which are, are uh, also uh, required. And here you see uh, various stages of the model in situ. Uh, another project of ours is on Figueroa and 59. Uh, so you see um, in Axon, in the Revit Axon in the lower uh, left, you see a a, a picture of the study model. Um, it is 41 units as designed by right. We can get it up to 52 units. Uh, that will be contingent upon our developer's ability to get additional rental subsidy. That's the only way that will uh, pencil uh, out. Similarly, that uh, has a CPIO. The ground floor is 14 feet high. The courtyard, uh, we're trying to use the stairs as we, uh, and um, uh, bridges as a way of animating the courtyard and we're, we have to pay for them anyway. So we wanna get a lot of visual and experiential mileage out of it and also as a way to build community. And then where we began uh, five or six years ago with um, uh, John Perfit and, and uh, Restore Neighbors Los Angeles and Genesis as a, the unbeknown found, funder at that point. Uh, we were hired, we, we met John uh, during the recession. Uh, even though we were broke, we were able to host a big event for SCAMP, Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing. So that's the good thing about having a space. And we met John and I think he was uh, amused, befuddled, maybe concerned that we were busting out of our skin with excitement about doing this prop these projects. Nine lots. Uh, three prototypes for nine lots, we built five of them. This was a long lot. Uh, these were 1,200 square foot houses with three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Uh, orchestrate open space, there you can see all the way to the street, the uh, space between the garage and the family room. This was a 25 foot wide property. Uh, there wasn't an inch to spare. We could just squeeze in a walkway aside the uh, uh, the housing on all of these projects, hyper important is as centralized circulation as possible. So on the left, the, you walk across the property to get to the center of the property where the front door is. And that then, uh, this is the space between the garage and the house. Uh, there's the living room. We paint a little bit of the living room, the same as the terrace to meld those spaces. And then an opening from the second floor bedroom down to the living room and terrace beyond. This one is one of our favorites. It's a, a 40 by 70 foot property, uh, really tiny. You can see in the plan, the articulated circulation, the front door is by the stairs. So you walk through the property and basically all of your circulation is within a six foot by 12 foot area. So whenever you walk through the house, you have to walk through the glass, uh, the sliding doors on either side of the staircase and the glass at the top of the staircase and see the property and see the city. And then this is uh, the same prototype, but a different house, different colors, uh, the view on the right from the entry back to the street, from the living room back to the entry on the right. And then there are unaffordable homes. Uh, this, but the idea is that the, le the, the, the architecture, the lessons here are the same, it don't matter. This house is uh, uh, 12,000, uh, over 12,000 square feet, but processional spaces, lots of natural light, 
open to the landscape. The ground plane is not painted. It's Portuguese limestone. Same idea though. And, uh, and uh, uh, the impact uh, uh, we think is, is pretty similar. And finally, very quickly, uh, some market rate uh, housing. In this case, this is five feet wider uh, than our youth at Promise, uh, Hovenus, uh, about the same size property, except these are five story high units uh, in West Hollywood, but still hyper consolidated circulation, trying to make the fancy stuff happen next to the stairs where you got to build them anyways. And then another project in West Hollywood, in this case, the celebration of circulation, you got to have stairs, you got to connect the buildings. So how do you turn them into architecture uh, and places of community that really animate the projects? And finally, uh, sort of eternal housing. Uh, the, uh, this is not, this is uh, Hollywood Forever Cemetery, uh, 30,000 units uh, of currently living but future dead people on an acre and a, and a half, which, add, which is about 21,000 units per acre. The units are hyper micro, uh, size of a person, no windows, no fresh air, some plumbing for leakage. And, uh, but that's not gonna solve our homeless problem unless COVID does us all in. And with that, I will turn it over to my partner, Naren. Thank you, Michael. Let's see if we can make this, uh a seamless transition. Okay, I think, can you see my screen? Mm. Mm -hmm. okay, very good. Thank you, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so Michael gave us a, a bit of an overview of what has been keeping us uh, busy at Layer Architects uh, in terms of housing. Uh, and uh, as he touched on the last uh, sort of series of projects that we've done with uh, restored neighborhoods and, uh, and John Perfit, uh, a bit more detail uh, tonight. So uh, this project uh, begins with, um, let's see. Ah, there we go. It begins with uh, <clears throat> begins with a lunch uh, between uh, uh, me and uh, and John Perfect, director of Restored Neighborhoods Los Angeles. So um, after completing the first tranche of projects, um, we haven't really uh, worked with John for a little bit. So um, we went out and he says, "You guys, as well, our architects, like a challenge." And I said, "Sure, very enthusiastically, we love a challenge." So we have five sites of different size. They're scattered throughout South LA. Can you provide uh, one home design for all of them? So I thought to myself, we just did that uh, for you. No problem, easy. <laughs> but John uh, uh, said, so it has to be built for under $200,000. So that gave me pause because the work, all the, all the projects that we've done thus far were upwards of $300,000. But being sort of the optimistic architect, I'm thinking, okay, well, was significant government oversight, prevailing wage, there's probably a way to make this happen, okay. So, but Naren, that number also has to include the permits. And so now I'm starting to deduct out of the construction costs, like what could the permits be on this? And before I can even finish, he's like, also your fee has to fit into the, into the number as well. So at this point, we're thinking, why, why would we wanna do this? Uh, this, uh, this seems, uh, uh, this doesn't really seem like, as, about, as I was about to politely decline the commission, he says, also, we'll be issuing the RFP next week, so um, you should really submit if you're interested. So not only is it seemingly an impossible challenge, we also had to compete for it. Anyway, so we, um, we did compete for it, and we submitted a proposal, and uh, we signed the contract with John in uh, October of uh, 2015. And as we're about to uh, start the design, I mean, this is so unusual. So the, the first thought was like, hey, well, it's got to be prefabs, uh, options for prefab. It seemed like that all the efficiencies that prefab has didn't really apply. We had multiple sites that were miles apart. Uh, the cranes alone would cost tens of thousands of dollars. 
um, prefab really saves you time, doesn't really save you cost, so it, it didn't make uh, too much sense for us. So then we looked at structural insulated panels or SIPs. Um, these panels come uh, prefabricated, you assemble them and, and uh, uh, there's certain efficiencies with them. But what um, turned out that um, you're really limiting your pool of contractors um, through which you can go out and uh, gather the, and, and, and get multiple bids and therefore uh, uh, com more competitive bids. And we were really ex um, trying to um, engage local contractors to see um, if we could uh, reap some benefits that way. So after we dismissed those two options, we the way to go, but we didn't even have a program. John didn't really tell us um, what exactly he wanted. Uh, so we, um, we looked at three bedrooms, two bathrooms, which is what, he, what his initial sort of take was when we asked the question, because that's just what, what we were doing. And, and we very quickly um, came up with a couple of uh, fairly conventional, uh, conventional plans. So we had in, Michael and I talked and, like, and we said, well, you know, um, what this is going to cost. So we went back to John um, and said, look, uh, we, we really, we, we can't do it this way. We have to be able to control the process. We have to be able to control the program. We have to be able to cost as we go. Uh, we'd really like to do the construction management uh, for, for the project. And, as, um, and he agreed uh, because it, it was really, we, we made a good point that it was really the only way to, to, to do the project, to bring it in the cost that he wanted. And as we looked at many options, we work a lot in models and we build uh, models very quickly and we build them often. And as sort of, um, uh, we, we worked through se uh, several scenarios, several, several designs, there were constants that were emerging. Um, the first is the long, uh, the long uh, colored line that guides the entry uh, shown here in, in, in blue. Uh, the service zone that's found in the center of the site and, uh, um, and houses uh, many of the support areas. Um, and then the kitchen, which sort of danced around the floor plan, but always was hovering in the, uh, towards the front of the property with, because it was really important to us to have eyes on the street from the kitchen. So as uh, we were sort of working through these, uh, through these plants, a plan, those particular elements uh, ended up being there. Um, so the entry zone, when if you look over to the left, the entry zone uh, is delineated in the long yellow line uh, that goes from the front of the property all the way to the back. And the idea there is that um, no matter how small or short your property is, your lot is, if you find one shot that takes you all the way through, uh, that's um, that's unobstructed, uh, you are, you're, you're sort of stretching your view to the entire view of the property and giving yourself uh, the ability to, to uh, a little bit of a sense of luxury because um, it, it, in other words, it, it would never, the property would never seem that long. Uh, the, um, uh, and then the, uh, since we weren't able to provide the, uh, the, the third, the third bedroom, um, um, just really quickly here. I'm going to go back really quickly. So here where we had the three three bedrooms and two bathrooms, we actually, um, as we as we talked to John about the construction management, we were able to uh, convince him. Um, and uh, he we, we then quickly engaged a contractor who priced the options out. We realized we were way over budget. We cannot afford the third bedrooms and two bathrooms. So that's what this model on the um, on the very right is. It's a, it's a reduced version of what we were doing. Uh, before, so it's a two-bedroom, a single bathroom option, which is sort of uh, 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 which is evident in here. And then the final floor plan has that uh, has the the two bedrooms and the and the shared bathroom in the middle. But we gave ourselves an out just in case the uh, owner really wanted to uh, build that third bedroom post. We provided an over on the right uh, in the axonometric. You can see how that could easily be added later on. So as we um, zoom in to uh, the floor plan, we want to talk about a couple of things. It's a, it's a bipartite, which means it's divided in 
in two parts. On the left, you have a fairly rational um, uh, two bedrooms uh, with a shared bathroom in between. And on the right, uh, you have a sort of a kinked or uh, indented rectangle. Well, the funny story about the rectangle is that it was a result of, uh, of the sort of, of the kink is that it was a direct result of us trying to literally shave square footage off the property. Uh, but we, were, we initially tried to do it on the other side. And then um, at some point, I think Michael said, well, it really doesn't make sense over here, but if we do it on the side of the dining and living, you could uh, really connect it to the outdoors and rather than having a, just a, a four foot, uh, simple four foot side yard, um, you can have a real nice indoor outdoor uh, connection uh, that can re result in a in a patio, and um, and constructed. That's um, uh, that's what it looks like. This is uh, looking up and down from the street through the patio. Another benefit. This is looking from the interior um, of, from the living area towards the towards the front entry. If you look to the side, you really get that that kink allows you to. Uh, get really dynamic diagonal views out to the street. So at every point you're connected to the patio, behind you you're connected to the patio, uh, to the side, and then also you're connected to the street. And um, so I want to spend a, a couple of minutes talking about the bathroom. Um, so as we lost that second bathroom, uh, we really didn't want to lose the flexibility of having several people be able to use the bathroom so um, at the same time. So what, um, what we did as a result and uh, gave the water closet its own space with its own door, uh, gave the tub and, the, and the, the laundry its own space, and then we pulled out the vanities and the sink outside uh, into, the, uh, into the sort of into the hall so that um, now you're able to simultaneously, four people could actually occupy the uh, bathroom at the same time. So in case that third bedroom is ever added, you're still not losing, uh, you're not losing that flexibility. So it's a, it's a way of trying to, to stretch the dollar and, and uh, accomplish uh, uh, several things at once. And this is actually looking, uh, this is a view right outside of that bathroom. Uh, here on the, on the left, uh, you have the bathroom wall. Um, the, the sinks are from Ikea and, the, and a simple mirror. We actually introduced a couple of um, uh, skylights that bring in natural light, uh, bounce it off the wall, bring it down into the, um, into the main space. Uh, and uh, we provided a, a, a little gap in between the top of the mirror and uh, the wall above to um, guide um, your eye and, and See, so you can really experience that natural light from behind that volume. That volume is uh, uh, hides the sinks, uh, hides the sinks in the back. So um, also, once you paint it a color, you bring that color down on the ground plane. It really stretches your eye all the way out to that bathroom wall. It makes the illusion of uh, of, uh, of, of appearing in the space uh, really bigger than it really is. And here on the on the right, Michael is marking up uh, the the stretch from the bathroom wall all the way out to that patio, which is uh, on the drawing on the right, uh, delineated by the white ground plane. And on the left, it's uh, because this is, a, uh, this is a different prototype, um, it's brought out uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the red color. Um, I also want to quickly point out the registers um, above uh, the, uh, uh, the, the little uh, vanity object. Um, and, um, on the right, if you look, that server zone we talked about before uh, is found in the center of the house. It runs down, up and down vertically, down the floor plan, and it houses the closets for uh, the bathroom, for the bedrooms. It houses the entry closet, the air handling unit closet, vanities, um, a little service area for the for the living space. Um, and, and additional um, and additional closets, but above the air handling unit, in fact, feeds the main duct, a single duct that runs up and down the house and um, uh, pushes air out into the bedrooms and into the main uh, living area. So again, trying to do as much as we can with a single 
uh, with a single move. Uh, so we really avoided uh, running ducts throughout, uh, uh, throughout the entire home there. Um, so the kitchen, the kitchen was the parts of any home. And initially we looked at research, we th we were researching various small spaces, Airstream trailers, uh, expensive European kitchens uh, that uh, really didn't make too much sense. And we, we actually realized that this is a home. It has to have ample, this is not a, a temporary shelter. This is not a micro unit. You have to have uh, um, you have to have some adequate space to do that. So we actually landed on uh, seemed like what seemed like was an obvious solution, um, an IKEA kitchen, which uh, for which we were able to get for under under five thousand dollars. The price on the screen actually includes the lighting, which we didn't get, but um, all of the appliances, all the cabinetry, and the countertops were uh, were obtained for less than six thousand dollars. And what, um, what's nice about, uh, uh, what was nice about the kitchen, what, what by the IKEA kitchen is that we're really for not a lot of money to take advantage of the high ceilings and to uh, generate and to get, uh, get a little bit more storage. So you notice that picture here doesn't have a fridge because in our design, the fridge was um, its own element, but um, the price that you saw did include the price, uh, uh, did include the refrigerator and panels that we bought from IKEA to then clad the fridge. Here's the instruction manual to the contractor how to, how to actually clad the refrigerator uh, in, the, um, in those panels. And here on the left, you can see um, the, the, the result. It's, uh, um, it's sort of an objet floating in the space. You're still able to experience the high ceiling um, above and that, and that high space, but it, it gives the kitchen um, a, a little bit of privacy and it sort of guides your entry as you, directs your entry as you move into the house. And, and the back side of the Michael's marking up is actually shelves uh, that, are, um, that are quite uh, usable. Um, so settled, uh, this looks like it's about uh, November of 2015. We, um, uh, we, we tried to tackle the roof and the roof really had to uh, solve uh, too many problems. It, 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 uh, it had to house the carport for, for, for two cars. Uh, it, uh, we had to deal with the uh, gathering of all the rainwater and directing it uh, towards the front of the street. And um, it was an opportunity to actually shape, uh, the, uh, to shape, the, to shape the space and shape, uh, and shape the house uh, so that it fits into, this, into its urban context. Um, the resulting a roof may seem um, a bit wacky at first to you, but um, as you sort of walk down the street, uh, you'll realize that that's the house um, in construction, uh, that it really sort of tips its hat to uh, the gable tradition of this neighborhood in a, um, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a new way. Um, what we call this uh, fitting in and standing out. Uh, we thought we felt very strongly the building should stand out because uh, it should uh, provide uh, enough. Uh, it should really energize the neighborhood. And this, these streets are so gorgeous. I mean, they are beautiful South LA streets. They're a little tired, so a new a new building that's fresh, energetic, really could imbue the entire street uh, with uh, sort of new new energy. And but at the same time, it should not stick out like a sore thumb. It should really, um, it should really uh, fit its, and respect its context. And then in terms of, in addition to the carport and the context, um, we also have to deal with the, the problem of gathering all the rainwater. Well, most of these South, uh, South LA sites are in a liquefaction zone, which means that you cannot take the rainwater and, and permit it into the ground. You have to gather it and hold it. And, uh, and eventually release it uh, towards, the, towards the street. So we were not able to um, put any of the water in the, uh, towards the back of the property. So we bent the roof in such a way that all the water was gathered uh, in a single place and at the front of the property. And then from there, a 700 gallon 
uh, rain barrel uh, the water tank to be released and reused uh, for uh, for later. Um, so, in terms of uh, the ground plane and and the use of the ground plane and the color, this is a list of this is a, a sort of a, a quick view overview of the four of four buildings that were that were built out of the initial five sites. Um, as you, as Michael showed before, we really try to use the ground plate to sort of um, to accentuate the views, to delineate spaces, and we felt that you know with uh, with opportunities for multiple um, uh, uh, multiple sites, we could you know we could be a little bit playful. So uh, three different sites. One is mirrored. We play with different sort of amounts of permeable landscape uh, with color and 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 saturation. And in this case, uh, we had um, uh, we really saturated the ground, the the the, end, the ground plane, and then uh, provided another uh, colored path as an inset to delineate the entry. And then we try to be opportunistic uh, wherever we could. Um, so this is um, this this uh, site happened to have a, a, a block wall in the back, which we um, we used to our advantage and sort of bent the color. Um, as it went up the wall, just to provide a nice terminus uh, for your eye as as um, um, as you sort of look through uh, through the site, and then we studied uh, uh, we studied the colors uh, for the various sites and numerous studies that had um, interior views and exterior views until we settled on a few, a few final colors. And here, see what we try to do is, and we talked about before, is pulls and unpainted concrete on the ground um, delineate uh, the, the living area. Uh, the white is defined, the, defines the dining. It also stretches that space all the way from the bathroom wall uh, to uh, to the patio. Yellow uh, defines the kitchen and guides the entry, and um, and together uh, they create a uh, a nice little. Uh, nice little dialogue, and it's just a way of delineating um, rooms within a room without walls, and um, and uh, <laughs> the delays. <laughs> um, so, with a design uh, sort of settled. Uh, we uh, we went to Planchik in February of 2016. Uh, actually, quite a uh, a, a few uh, four months after the contract said, which seems like a lot of time, but um, we sort of hit the the first couple of months. We, we I think we saw the, the the house in the first couple of months, and um, and then we tried to get the permit over the counter with uh, with a type uh, five construction sheet without engineering uh, attached to it, and uh, we were promptly laughed at by the plan checker who said all the walls have to be. 90 degrees. We cannot have any angles. So we went back and we worked, worked with a worked with an engineer, and uh, very quickly actually turned out what we had was structurally very efficient because of, of how few moves there were. Um, and uh, we went into plan check um, with uh, maybe five five uh, cover sheet and, and, and five other sheets. Uh, we added a, a, a six sheet that 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 uh, defined the ground planes for bidding. Which was really we felt was really important, but the set was quite basic, and we felt that we solved uh, most of the problems, and that the re whatever wasn't solved, that we would be able to do that in construction, which, um, you know, working as a team with a with a contractor. So the plan check was pretty basic, a few months, and then, as construction managers, we actually organized uh, the bidding process, put the bidding documents together. Advertised for the bid and solicited um, maybe a, maybe a dozen bids uh, for um, I believe which ranged from anywhere from 165 to 300 thousand dollars, and we selected a contractor who uh, actually a couple of contractors, uh, one of which uh, uh, did some of the initial pricing, and he gave us a, a four month construction schedule, which really scared the bejesus out of me. So um, I uh, thought I was being really smart and I added it in the month before I presented it to. Um, so it turns out how quickly uh, this thing came together. 
Uh, in July of 2016, we already had the footings dug up, site was graded. A month later, all the uh, um, plumbing, underground plumbing and uh, the slabs were done. And then the building went up in a matter of a month uh, with, uh, with the siding. And as it usually you know, happens, um, in December, we had, you know, we had a couple months later, we had the finishes, but as it usually happens, then the contractors at some point loses interest, that gets distracted, the, the finishing always, stretched out, always stretches out. So we wrapped the project, um, I think in, towards the end of December or beginning of, uh, beginning of January of next year. So still not too bad. Um, five to five to six months um, of, of, of construction for the, first, uh, for the first couple of houses. So again, just sort of as a overview of everything we talked about, a couple of sort of a um, uh, couple of images of the of the finished product, uh, the house in context. Uh, you can see the yellow line that guides you through. The solar panels were actually uh, donated um, by a uh, by a nonprofit um, uh, after completing all the energy studies. Uh, we realized that the solar panels provide um, more than uh, seventy. Uh, this actually this house is uh, seventy percent more efficient than a standard home. We learned um, quite a few lessons. If the if the if we were able to get a bigger um, solar array, it would have been completely covered in a net zero home. Um, and uh, since then, we probably if we were to do this again, we'd probably go all electric as opposed to have um, a gas to be absolutely sure that most of the needs are needs are covered. I mean, again, this was. Uh, five years ago, so quite a few things that we've learned since then. Uh, in the front of the property here, you see the screen that Michael has marked up. That's actually the screen was erected to hide the um, the water barrels, uh, which were in the front of the property. You can kind of see them behind the screen. Again, a view from the interior, from the living area, looking out. You can see how the that refrigerator. Um, object uh, sort of hides the hides the kitchen. You can see the light pouring from the skylights behind the vanity volume. Uh, a bright yellow wall that guides you through. Uh, shot of the mirrored unit with uh, red and the entry. Indoor outdoor connection to the patio outside. Views to the garden and from the kitchen. And again. Um, a house, uh, the house that as it sits uh, in the, uh, on, its, on the street, really gorgeous, gorgeous street on a beautiful Southern California day, uh, looking out to downtown. And uh, this, uh, uh, I think this is my, uh, this is my last slide. So just as a, just as a, a fun point, um, so we, uh, our client let us play on, uh, on three houses. And, um, for, but for the last one, he decided that he wanted to select all the finishes. So everything was, um, everything was complete. But on the last one, I actually found the, the, the pictures from the um, MLS uh, site. And this is, uh, um, this is uh, what it uh, ended up looking like. And, uh, you know, our client shows all the finishes. Um, some of the, um, well, actually, none of the delineations that we talked about earlier um, are, are found, but, you know, the, the, the home has a bit more of a traditional... Uh, we love our client, but we are crestfallen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you've seen any, it published anywhere, uh, you haven't seen a picture of this, although this is the house where we actually, all the lessons of the first houses were really learned and put... Oh, this into play here. All the, all the lessons where we actually picked up a few items on here which we weren't able to do before. This is the, the third bedroom is, um, is actually built on this one with the trellis. Um, but um, yeah, this one will not be, uh, this one will not be out there, not be published. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, we do have some conversation going back in here. So I'm just going to call out on some people who have, um, uh, chatted a little bit and see if they want to mention any more to the group. And if you don't, that's fine. Um, uh, Will, you were going back and forth. Um, I actually don't know who this is. I don't see it's not a full name. Um, about uh, um, Will, if you just want to elaborate what you guys were chatting about. 
Yeah, I'll let Mark, uh, Mark, you still have okay, the sorry, Mark. I think this is a really important point. It has to do with the CPIO and how this is getting in the way of a lot of the feasibility of a lot of projects. Yeah, we have a uh, affordable project we did on Central Avenue and it has no retail, but we yet still had to do 14 foot high ceilings on it. It has a lot of ground floor units. And so, you know, one, one bedroom units really don't need a, a 14 foot high ceiling, nor do you really want a 14 foot high ceiling in a unit that small, you know, it adds cost to it. And even the small area of common space where we have offices, it's a lot higher ceiling than we need there also. So then the client's paying for, you know, it, a certain percentage of it also has to be glass too, is also part of the CPIO requirement. So they're paying for more glass, which gets exponentially more expensive the higher you go on it. Uh, and then that's that much more graffiti coating they have to put on the glass because it's not in a very great neighborhood also. So it's just, you know, it, I, I think it's, it's um, I think the intentions were good because a lot of um, ground floor spaces get built for retail and they don't end up getting leased because there's, you know, a standard that retailers look for a 14 foot high. And if it doesn't have that, they just move on by. And that's why we have a lot of empty retail on, on big quarters. So the intent was good there, but I think it, it like you pointed out, Will, I think it needs some modification. I think there's a real learning curve here. I mean, you know, in real time, everything seems like slow and plotting. In fact, uh, some of our projects that are actually in the building have already been in the permit process. And we're actually going from the TOC requirements to Assembly Bill 1763 because it allows things. So the, 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 the ground is shifting constantly. Uh, we have found that the planning department is happy to be engaged in really meaningful um, conversations. And it's the process of fleshing things out. I mean, I, as an architect and an urbanist and a lover of my city and any cities, I appreciate, as you pointed out, the value of having a higher retail level, but clearly the, the, there's, there's gotta be a way to honor the street with a higher space and not build all that extra un, not usable space. And it actually also really screwed us up until seven, another bill saved us uh, in terms of pushing us against the height limit, uh, you know, three or four feet short of being able to do a nice roof guard. But I think, I, I think one of the, the important ideas here is uh, we all have to be very proactively involved. We have to reach out to people in planning, to people in building, you know, to the city council members. Um, before, you know, this is an ongoing conversation, and I think uh, the difference of now and before, or maybe any effective development in any time, is you have to you have to reach out and embrace the conversation, and you also have to hang in there, you know, and keep your eyes on the prize in terms of what these projects have to be, and not give up. As Michael said, um, you really have to get engaged. Uh, I was. Uh, pleasantly surprised to see how um, and uh, to, to see our commentary. We're, we're part of a, of a couple of uh, groups of architects and um, I guess activists to try to better the zoning code. And in fact, uh, um, just, uh, just last month we were engaging in a call just like this where a group of architects has contributed a number of changes to the zoning code um, where um, that, that are that were probably initially those those particular items in the zoning code were initially well intended, but as society changes, those things need to evolve as well. And uh, it, uh, we were pleased to see that our all our comments were pleasantly received, and in fact, most of them are already as part of this new zoning code that's coming out. It's still several years out but um, at least they're listening and at least they're responding. So that was, a, that was a, a very nice thing to see. So again, we'd encourage you to, to get engaged and uh, either through AIA or directly with the planning department. Great. Um, so we do have a lot of questions. I wanna be aware of everyone's time. So Michael and Niran, any anytime that you guys feel like you can't go any longer, let me know, but we will go, if you're okay with going for at least 10 more minutes, we'll see how many questions we can get through. Um, okay, uh, Seth, you had a couple questions a little while ago about 
um, covered garages and financing, if you want to unmute yourself and maybe just touch on one of those. Yeah. Um, with with the, the parking, I mean, obviously in this uh, project where it's a carport, it's a lot less of an issue. Um, but just the fact that we still have covered parking requirements and, right, that's essentially increasing any home by 400 square feet, uh, even though most people park in the driveway anyway. Um, so just wondering about, uh, you know, if you think there's traction uh, with the city to consider uh, loosening up, you know, the, the types of parking that's required uh, to allow more flexibility uh, in reducing costs. So we were, I'll, I'll quickly, Michael, you can chime in. Um, we haven't touched on that um, in our conversations, haven't touched on that uh, particularly as it relates to single family residences. Um, I think there is a sense towards uh, reducing the required parking, uh, reducing the parking, whether it's covered or, or uncovered, uh, but that's actually the driver now with some of these more, uh, more dense developments. As far as the single family developments um, are concerned, again, the density is being increased by adding uh, ADUs, um, et cetera. Um, we, were, uh, we were, again, we approached the city about uh, reducing the parking requirements and the way they're structured as they relate to larger projects, but not towards single family homes. Uh, uh, per se. I mean, this project that we just presented was uh, was all done by right. We had uh, no time to go in and and you know battle the code. It was the idea was to try to to, to get it uh, to ground as in the ground as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean, you'll see in the project that uh, you know that, that you see the image of. I mean, it's actually it's sort it's both a carport and an entry pavilion i mean it's if you look at it carefully it's sort of doing a bunch of stuff and not doing anyone very purely um uh, you know uh, as far as i'm concerned <clears throat> i mean i'd be happy to get rid of all that stuff and uh um we are you know i i think and i think i, I mean i think that the the future has been really accelerated by our uh, coronavirus crisis. Uh, you know, we are seeing where we would be in five years or 10 years now. And, uh, and again, myself as a new convert to e-biking, um, you know, I've gotten in my car twice in the last two months and, um, and I'm, I'm pretty darn exhilarated about that. And so I, I think also, even between all of the uh, disruptive technologies of the last five, six, seven, eight years of, you know, lift services and uh, scooters and bikes and everything, things are changing so very quickly. And, um, and you know, so I, I think um, exaggerated accommodation to cars uh, is probably going to uh, change, uh, continue to change uh, in a hurry. But as architects, I mean, at the end of the day, you got to design what the law requires you to design or build. So we just have um, a few kind of spec questions here from Gabrielle. Um, I'll just say them for you unless you want to add more. Um, who was the contractor um, and what was the final square footage of this home? Um, Naren. Naren. Well, Naren was actually uh, a construction. Uh, the, well, we had uh, two contracts. Uh, yes, yes, I was, but uh, we had two contractors, uh, Red Star Construction and Magic Construction, uh, one of which has retired since. And the final square footage of the home was uh, 1,024 square feet precisely. I'm so sorry. Um, I was the one who had asked the question. You cut out when you were talking about the contractors, but I heard the square footage. Uh, two contractors, Magic Construction, which uh, re retired, and then Red Star Construction, which built three of the homes. Thank you. 
Uh, and then David has a quick question here also about um, what is the bright colored material used on the exterior paving? Hmm. Paint. Paint. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, um, it's an ongoing, we, 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 <clears throat> the ground plane is an incredibly important uh, part of our design uh, palette. Um, you know, and for those of you who are, you know, sort of spend your time as most of you, I imagine, do in the realm of the visual, you realize that, you know, probably 60 or 70 percent of when you look at anything is the ground plane. So, uh, you know, we try to do the most, we're still, we're, we're, we're still testing things. I mean, both for durability as well as slipperiness and whatever, but it is an incredibly straightforward way to, to create something out of nothing. So um, we do have other more technical questions, but we have a good question here. Um, I'm sorry, I don't want to butcher your name, but Shava Danielson. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, it's if you want to unmute yourself, um, I think it's a good question about um, Thank you. how to get people willing to listen. And then we'll yeah. end on that. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, all in favor of uh, outreach, of being engaged at the city. I certainly join all kinds of meetings, helping planning and, and know people there. And yet I've found that, uh, um, you know, my office works with a lot of nonprofits and the site is always some incredibly difficult site and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of hoops to jump through. And so uh, I have found though that um, it's very difficult to get people to, uh, to find a person who's in a position who has the authority and the agency to make a common sense decision. Uh, you know, they're, they're frightened. There's a lot of lawsuits going on against the planning department. I, I really understand where they're coming from, but there have been some uh, very, very simple common sense decisions that could have been made pretty easily. And yet my client, my uh, nonprofit client uh, on a particular preschool had to go through eight months of you know, a CUP, which was really not necessary, for example. And so I, I, I don't know if you've got some names or a process you can share with us uh, that might work better. Uh, well, I think keep your expectations low. I mean, in general, that's a recipe <laughs> for a good and happy life. Um, I think try not to judge. I think middle level, you know, any, any people lower than the top level ultimately are simply not in a position to make uh, any decisions that have any risk attendant to them. I think being relentless and respectful and, uh, you know, I mean, this is our lot. It's, you know, I mean, you know, sort of being obsequious and, and uh, kind to people who don't necessarily warrant it, but a lot of people who really do. And everybody's in this together. I mean, I think the, 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 the point you made is that, I mean, it's interesting, it's like, even in this uh, health crisis, uh, in the beginning, everybody's saying do stuff faster, faster, faster. And in three months, anybody who did something fast and did it wrong, didn't get it right, their careers will be destroyed for making mistakes. I mean, this is the dance and we're in the middle of it. So I just think reaching out and, um, you know, I think that uh, you can also tell when you're talking to people who fundamentally have a bureaucratic bent in the sense that, yes, this is a great thing to do. It will happen in about five years. And other people in the same position or similar positions who don't say, wow, this is a great thing to do. Let's figure together out how to make this happen. I think it's, it's hit or miss. And I think it just has to become habit to, to go there. And uh, another thing uh, I consider this a trade secret I am sharing with you all. And that is, I think it's important to call people in the city when good things happen and let them know so they know you're not only calling to fetch and whine when something is wrong, like every other human being. You earn the right to be listened to by being nice and giving them the pleasure of having good news along the way. Absolutely. I think thanking people 
profusely yeah. for the smallest accomplishment is a huge, yeah. hugely important. And we don't do it enough. Absolutely. So thank you. Definitely. Well, I think on that note, um, we'll end it. If you guys have anything else to share, um, Michael or Niran. No, I would just thank you for the opportunity to share a little project with everybody. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a real pleasure. Yeah. A very fun way to spend time with friends and colleagues and, uh, and others. A great way to spend the afternoon and, and uh, stay healthy. I mean, you know, if you're, uh, if you're healthy and uh, living in a good enough to darn good place, uh, you know, this is uh, count your blessings and uh, be present. <laughs>